So I'm going to talk to you uh, about this question about whether um, health and safety management systems or management systems in general actually make a difference to performance. But I thought I'd start by telling a little bit of story in terms of my journey um, as a health and safety professional. So I alluded to it on the session this morning that I started working for the HSE um, as an inspector. And I didn't come from sort of an engineering or technology background. It was all new to me, a really comprehensive training program. But one of the things that I was introduced to was HSG 65. I was like, gosh, why, why, why would anybody do this? Um, and it became very clear to me that actually, you know, if, you, if you're going to make, do a good job in terms of your health and safety management, make a difference, you need a framework, you need something to follow to make sure you get it right, you don't have gaps. So I started to be a con convert and did a, a lot of audits when I was at HSE. And then obviously things evolved. So I've always found it a really interesting discussion. I was a convert very early, but it can be really difficult when you're having conversations within your own organizations, making the business case, what's the purpose? You know, the conversation we had this morning, oh, isn't it just paper, oh, and what's the point? And you know, where, where's the value? So it's always interesting to see whether we can get, gather meaningful evidence beyond kind of what we feel in our gut or, or how we are converted on this. So hopefully this session will be um, really interesting for you. So um, we talked a little bit about BSI being an, uh, an international organisation. We offer a whole range of, of services um, from the standards where we start all the services that go with standards, the assurance, the internal audits, the certification, the training. We also have consultancy business. We do product certification. A lot of organisations don't really understand the scope of BSI. Um, and we focus in, in kind of some key areas, key sectors. Um, but we've got a, a really big focus in terms of digital trust, so that's all sort of all things cyber and internet, doing some really amazing stuff in terms of smart cities um, and the internet of things. Um, sustainability, so, you know, well, however broad you go with your definition or how narrow you go with your definition of sustainability, we do it all. Um, and at the heart of that is about innovation. So... That's just reflecting what I covered this morning um, from our international presence. So I thought I'd, you know, we had a bit of a conversation about this this morning, that the pandemic, I think, has hopefully, for a lot of us, really changed the, the, the dialogue around the benefits of, of health and safety. I mean, I've always been in, in the same camp as Zoe was this morning in terms of actually health and safety is enabler. It's the, it's the thing that allows you to do all the great stuff you want to do. Um, but that's not always how it's seen. But I think, you know, the, the pandemic, um, initially, you know, people suddenly were, fur health and safety professionals were furloughed and then they realised they needed to came, come back to keep operating. And it has changed the, the conversation. And certainly, you know, one of the things that BSI does every year is we do an um, uh, organisational resilience um, index. We go out and we ask companies about, you know, what they're doing to stay relevant, to cope with risk, to manage risk. Um, and one of the things that's come through very clearly is the organisations that have managed the kind of disruption of the pandemic most effectively are the ones that really focused on their people. Um, and that, in turn, has kind of continued that drive to, well, what actually do you need within an organisation to really look after your pe people? And what you need to do is create a culture of care and a culture of trust. So what does that look like? It's not, it's no one thing. It's a, it's a whole combination of, of factors. As it says here, you know, you need the collaborative, um, communicative, emotionally intelligent leadership. So that's always an interesting one. You need diversity and inclusion. That's what drives your innovation. That also is what underpins trust, making sure you've got the respect and fairness there. You need those opportunities for development, lifelong learning. It's a really key part of engagement for your workforce. You need to think about not just how, people are, uh, how much people are paid, but actually how you say thank you, which is a lot of organisations don't think about that. Touched upon social value, which I'll come back to, that social capital, but without a doubt, you know, it's increased the focus in terms of how we look after not only the physical safety of our workforces and our contractors, as we were talked about it this morning, but also the mental um, uh, health and safety. So that focus has kind of driven much more looking at how we uh, approach this in a much more joined up way. 
Some of you will have um, seen this. I've talked about it before. It's um, BSI's Prioritising People model. It's an overarching framework for creating that culture of trust, really about changing and creating an authentic culture um, that looks at engagement, that looks at well-being, looks at physical safety, it looks at psychological safety, it looks at the whole remit. But you may recognise that it's kind of inspired by Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and it's all underpinned um, at the bottom by having a decent, safe, healthy, and compliant workplace. So this is where our health and safety management system approach would sit. So that's kind of, I just want to give some context to, the, to this session and kind of where we are. But I'm here to talk about um, the first independent study that's been done to look at actually whether um, a health and safety management system makes a difference to performance. So just sort of quick show of hands. I was going to use technology, but technology has let me down completely or, or actually shout, shout out. For those of you who are following management system, whether it's HSG 65, 45,001 as it is now, maybe you're still using 18,001. What, what benefits do you see internally? Why, why have you chosen to do it? Give structure. Structure? See where you are. See where you are? Integration with other systems, yeah. Easy sell to senior management. E easy sell to senior management. Oh, we need to speak to this person about that. Good, because it's not always easy, so that's good to, good to know. Anything else? It drives continual improvement. Drives continual improvement. There's somebody who's been audited. Clients demand it. Clients demand it, contractual obligations. Mitigation, yeah. So, you know, when we, we obviously regularly speak to our clients and go back and say, you know, well, what are your drivers for using it? All of these things, all of these things come up. Um, and, you know, and of course I'm going to sit here now. I'm, I work for BSI. I'm going to stand up here and go, yeah, they're the greatest thing in the world, aren't they? Why wouldn't you? But you're not going to believe me necessarily. I'd like to think you would. But um, so how do we demonstrate it? How do we look at that actual benefit independently? So some research was um, conducted over the last few years by Harvard Business School in America, um, and they basically wanted to explore this question. So, and they kind of divided up into two questions. Did safer workplaces in the US get certified to 18,001? So that certification step's an interesting one. Um, and did certification make those workplaces safer? So the study was done in the US because it was done by Harvard, um, and they had access to um, records from a number of certification bodies, so looking at uh, all certification bodies, and then they had access to the uh, OSHA records, so like RIDA reporting, the equivalent, if you like, of RIDA reporting. And they basically did an analysis between the two to say, okay, right, of these organisations that got certified, you know, what, what does their, their riddle record look like and, and what conclusions can we draw or not from that? So that's the basic context for the study. The other thing that's just worth mentioning, it was done on 18,001 and, of course, that's now replaced by 45,001. Um, and the reason it was done on 18,001 is, is kind of two and they're related. When this study started, um, 45,001 hadn't actually been published quite important, but also they needed a significant a, a number of years, periods of records to actually make the judgment. And of course, you know, 45,001, I mean, it's coming up to its five-year anniversary next year. Can you believe it? But it, there wasn't enough time to have the evidence, so that's why it's looking at 18,001. But of course, that has been replaced by 45,001. Um, so that's the kind of the context for this study. So what did they find? So the first research question was around, did safer workplaces in the US get certification to 18,001? Um, so they, once they'd done an analysis and done a sorting and sifting, they had about 300 records um, to compare and, and look at this against um, all of the other establishment records. Um, and they did find very clearly that organisations that were safer got certified. Now, as a health and safety professional, I go, well, I think that's probably obviously the case. Sometimes you see this with research questions, you go, well, that just answers the, the question you're asking for. 
And I think if you've, if you've ever been on that journey, you know, it's a maturity journey, organisations that start to look at implementing a health and safety management system are, are more mature, they've already got the systems in place and they are generally performing better. And fundamentally, this research just kind of confirms that from a different point of view. Um, but in what they found was that, you know, the, the, the higher the accident rate, the further you were from the journey towards certification. So it kind of the, the reverse piece, but the, the principle was the same. So not necessarily a surprise as health and safety professionals. We'd like to think if we're implementing a management system, it's making a difference, but it's always good to have it confirmed independently. But the second question was a really interesting one. So those organizations that get certified to not just implement the system because you can implement it, but actually get that certification so that independent assurance uh, process, were they any safer? And they found resoundingly, yes, they were. Um, and I think it's just, actually the numbers were quite phenomenal when, when you looked at it. They found that actually it was a, organizations that had certification had a 20% lower incident rates than organizations that didn't. 20%, I mean, that's pretty phenomenal, isn't it, I would say. Um, and they looked at, again, like in the same way for riddles that we have different categories, so sort of over seven days, majors and fatalities, they have the same sort of approach to those different categories in America. And actually they found that, you know, overall 20% for all um, types of injury, um, but actually, when they looked and drilled down at the individual types of injuries, they saw the same performance or even greater in performance improvement. So really interesting in, in terms of the, the, the context of this. Um, so really powerful. I mean, it, it, somebody came up to me after the session this morning and said, oh, I really like your evidence-based approach. I am evidence-based. Um, you know, I think it's really important that we can look at this and, and make that decision or make the the business case if we haven't got, <laughs> like, I want to work for this guy's company. He's a it was really easy sell. Um, you know, actually, if we can demonstrate that there is independent evidence from a trusted source like Harvard Business School that says, look, this is what they found, I think that's really powerful. So at the, um, you'll get a copy of the presentation at the, at the end, you can go and read the full study and, and look at the um, kind of the detail, if you like. And they're going to continue to do some more work on this. Um, one of the things that you know will potentially be really interesting to revisit, and um, the the team that uh, did this, we did a joint webinar where they talked about it. You know, we know 18,001 was a really good framework, but 45,001 is even better. So, will the performance be even better? interesting discussion and thinking about psychological health and safety you know if organizations are implementing 45,003 which is a new international standard on psychological health and safety so stress in the workplace um, you know will we see a similar level of performance um, improvement for organizations that use it can you again if you think about the, the level of um, psychological harm within organizations imagine what a 20 percent improvement would make that's, that's phenomenal. It's really exciting. So they're going to continue to do more work um, and, and kind of watch and monitor this and potentially revisit it. But i just like to kind of make the, the point. Um, a lot of... I didn't pay the gentleman in the middle who said about continual improvement, but a lot of organisations often think when we talk about certification, they think getting the certificate is the end of the journey. Yay, I've got the piece of paper. Well, we've had a discussion about the value of piece of papers. There is a process that you go through to get certification, but the value is not on getting the certificate. The value actually becomes after that in terms of driving continual improvement. So I just really wanted to kind of em emphasize it. But ha perhaps, like many things, a picture pa paints a thousand words. So when you're thinking about your certification journey, this is a, not a bad way of thinking about it. So, you know, your, your first process, so a certification cycle lasts three years. So what does it look like? Well, you're kind of just framing it, you're just getting the structure in place. You know, your second and your third cycles is when you re refine it and you go from a, a piece of mould to a, a perfect spot. But beyond that, you've got to add the rest of the enterprise crew. 
And then you've got to do new generation. And then you've got to do Deep Space Nine. Then you've got to do Enterprise. And you can continually improve on that. And the other thing with audits, you know, we, we see, and I'm sure you've all been here and thought about this when you're doing the audits. <coughs> you know, this is not what we're looking for. This is not what we're talking about. This is not continual improvement. You know, that rushing around going, oh, the audit is coming, the audit is coming. Oh. It's, like, it's like when the queen comes and they paint the grass, you know. It's just you're really missing the point of the value here. Um, so I just wanted to um, finish uh, in terms of uh, uh, kind of that point. So this is the link for the study. Um, it's still under peer review, um, so you can go in, you can download the study and have a look a bit more of a detailed look at it. Um, and obviously um, information on 45001 and 45003 as kind of supporting standards to help drive improvements. <coughs>